Okay, we're going to try this again. Been having some technical issues this morning and already tried twice and it hasn't worked, so we're going to try it again. <clears throat> um, hope you're having a good day, a day that you can do something for God. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, like I say, I'm still having some technical issues here. And, uh, but we're going to try it and see what happens. The title of the lesson is uh, Walking with God. And the word walking has a different meaning in the scriptures than how we normally use the word. Our usage deals with putting one foot in front of the other and moving in a moderate pace and direction. In the scriptures, the word has a meaning more of a behavior or a manner of life, or we might say lifestyle. And Jesus described the way to God as being narrow and straight. You know, Matthew 7, 14, the broad way leads to destruction. The way to eternal life is narrow and straight. And so when we get on this narrow pathway, we must walk directly towards God and heaven. You know, Hebrews 12, 2 says, focusing on Jesus. So that's where our focus needs to be on how to get to heaven. And God has told us how to get to heaven. We just need to do it. So our goal is heaven, and we must walk in such a way, we must live in such a way, that God will invite us in. <clears throat> we just cannot drift around. That, that's too dangerous. I mean, we've got to get focused on where, where our life is taking us. And we must be diligent to stay on that narrow pathway. Jesus used the phrase, strive to enter that narrow pathway. So we've got to put forth some effort on this. Some people think they can just casually go along, and it's not going to happen. So we may have to leave others we care about on another pathway. And we cannot go with the masses because their way leads to destruction. And so we cannot enjoy the pleasures of the world and stay on the straight and narrow. I mean, that's just something we have to learn. We have to make a choice. And really, the choice is ours. Now, God, by his mercy and grace, has given us and told us what the two options are going to be, either life or death, either right or wrong, either heaven or hell. And he's leaving the choice up to us, and if we want to benefit, we must make the right choice. And only you can do that. No one can do it for you. There is no such thing as proxies uh, to speak on behalf of others or face judgment on behalf of others. You might say, well, maybe Jesus, no, Jesus didn't do that. He just paid the penalty for, for your sins. All right, so others can help you, but nobody can force you. And you must willingly live your life on the pathway that leads to heaven. You have to have, be determined to, to be on that pathway. And so we look at it this way. The Bible is the roadmap. Other Christians are your guiding lights and Jesus is the way. And of course, yes, we have scripture to back that up. So we're going to look at the phrase walk and how it's used in the scriptures. We're, we're going to bounce around a little bit and get a few passages of scripture. But as we look at this, we're going to see how it's used in scripture. And a few cases will actually mean people walking and in other words, uh, moving in a moderate or in, in a specific direction by using their feet. And yes, but when we see most of what we're going to be reading today has to deal with the way that we live, our manner of lifestyle. Are we following the path that God has given us or are we doing our own thing? So let's just read some of these passages in Genesis 17 and 1. It says, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. And uh, so that's what we're supposed to do, walk before God. I mean, we're all in the presence of God. God sees everything we do, but are we walking in his way? In Exodus 16, 4, the Lord said to Moses, behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. In other words, are they going to do what I told them to do? That's what God said why he was going to test them. And 
in Exodus 18, 20, you shall teach them the statutes and the laws and show them the way in which they must walk and the work they must do. And there's a reason for this. God said he would bless them if they followed his instructions and did what he said, and he would curse them if they did not. All right. Um, in Leviticus 18.4, the command comes, You shall observe my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk in them. I am the Lord, your God. So they, were, they weren't supposed to follow other gods or do other things. The previous verse in verse 3 talked about don't do like the Egyptians where you came from. Don't do like the Canaanites who are the inhabitants of this land. You've got to do what God tells you to do. And Deuteronomy 5.33, you shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live and that it may be well with you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which you shall possess. And, and so that, that's, I mean, walking with God. Now, in, verse, uh, in chapter 6 and verse 7 of Deuteronomy, it says, You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. See, this is one of the few times where the word walk means actually forward movement by using your feet. But the emphasis of this passage is he's talking about the laws of God to be careful to do and observe them, and teach them to everybody in your household. Teach them to your children and talk of them when you sit in your house. Talk about God and his ways. And even when you're going somewhere, you need to do that. You know, in the New Testament, we have the example that in Acts 8, 4, they went everywhere preaching the word. I mean, that's what we should be focused on, sharing the message of God with others all the time. Now, in Deuteronomy 11, 22, it says, For if you carefully keep all these commandments which I command you to do, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to hold fast to him. I mean, blessings are going to be there for them. And uh, let's go down several centuries, down to uh, when Solomon is about to dedicate the temple. 1 Kings 6, 12, Concerning this temple which you are building, if you walk in my statutes, execute my judgments, keep all my commandments, and walk in them, then I will perform my word with you, which I spoke to your father, David. All right, God's talking to Solomon, telling him, you know, I made some promises to your father, but it's really dependent upon you. And what that teaches us, God's promises are conditional. There, there, there's very few promises that God gave which don't have any conditions attached to it. And very few of those in the Bible, just about all of them, yeah, I mean, God promised to take care of the people, but they turned their back on God. So he, he didn't fulfill what he said he was going to do because they broke the covenant. And the prophets kind of mentioned that on several occasions. They broke the covenant so God did not keep what he said he would do. It was all conditional. And the condition is still there. How many times in the New Testament do we, do we find the word if? If as a condition. If you are faithful. If you walk in my way. If you suffer, suffer with me. And all those, all those things. All right. Now, after, when the temple is dedicated, Solomon's telling the people says, let your heart therefore be loyal to the Lord our God to walk in his statutes and keep his commandments as at this day. I mean, at that time, everybody said, yeah, we're going to do it. We'll serve the Lord. And they were okay. But it was just a matter of years and Solomon departs from God. And when Solomon departs from God, the people just follow along. They depart from God as well. And so when Solomon dies, the people, they're just ready to split up the whole nation. And Psalms 84, 11 says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. And so that's, that's true. I mean, people who walk uprightly and, and follow God's ways, he's not going to withhold anything good for them. But those who are against God and turn their back on God, he is going to withhold the good from them. 
Psalm 86, 11, Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. And so, yeah, Lord, teach me and I will do. I mean, that, that's what we should be looking for. And that's what we should be doing. And that's what we should be impressing upon people to do. Hear what God has to say and do it. I mean, we, we should be asking, as the psalmist said in Psalm 119, 35, Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. You know, if you don't delight in something, you're not going to keep doing it. We need to teach people to enjoy the laws of God and do them. Because the benefits and the blessings that we receive from it far outweigh the punishment that is in store for those who don't do it. All right, so... Uh, in Isaiah 42, in verse 24, I mean, the nation is coming apart, falling apart, and he and Isaiah speaking to Israel, saying, Who gave Jacob for plunder and Israel to the robbers? Was it not the Lord, he against whom we have sinned? For they would not walk in his ways, nor were they obedient to his law. So all the calamity came upon not only Israel, but Judah, and Isaiah's point out, well, it's not God's fault that this is happening. We turned our back on God. The people would not serve him, would not obey his law. And therefore, he, he's doing what he promised he would do. He would cause us to be destroyed. See, Jeremiah 6.16 6, said something about the same thing about 140 years later. Thus says the Lord, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is, and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. So people said that they decide they're going to turn their back on God. And that's what they said they were going to do. All right, in Ezekiel 37, 24, Ezekiel's given a little prophecy when he says, David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd, and they shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. Now, prophetically, he is talking about the Christ. Christ said, I am the true shepherd. And um, so people shall walk in the judgments of Jesus and his teaching and observe his laws and do them. Yes, this is prophetic language for the establishment of the church. And Micah 6, 8 says, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So once again, walking humbly with God is to humble yourselves before the mighty hand of God. And <clears throat> we need humility. Humility is necessary. All right, so in John 8 and 12 in the New Testament, Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So darkness is sin. I mean, it's just a representation of sin and ignorance. But whoever follows Jesus is going to have the light lighting, lighting the way. And so Jesus is that true light. All right. Um, in Romans 8, 1, Paul said, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. In other words, talking about people who have turned their life over to Jesus, and they don't walk according to the ways of the world, uh, that's what it means by the flesh, but according to the Spirit, to the teachings of God. In 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight. And so we're supposed to do that. Galatians 5, 16 says, walk in the spirit. You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you're focused on the spirit and doing what God says, you're not going to fall into the problems of the flesh. And then he goes on to speak about the, the works of the flesh and what they are and why we should stay away from them. But then he also mentions the fruit of the spirit. And those are the things we're supposed to do. And so he finishes that passage in Galatians 5, 25. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And Ephesians 2, 10 
It says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God has plans for Christians and he wants them to do certain things. And he, he, he designed these things and we should be doing those things God has planned for us to do. We need to do God's work, not our own work. Our own work's not gonna do us any good, but God's work will. And so Ephesians 4.11, therefore the prisoner of the Lord, I bes Ephesians 4.1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Now the walk word walk here, I mean, that just means how you're gonna live. You gotta live worthy of the calling which you were called. We were called out of darkness into his marvelous light, into his dear, the kingdom of his dear son. And we need to behave in such a way that we demonstrate our allegiance to Christ. Ephesians 5, 2 says, And walk in love, as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. As we go through life, love has got to be the foundation. You know, Jesus said the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God. Second greatest commandment, love others. Upon these two rests the whole law. And so that's why we needed to walk in love. Everything about the law was given in love. So people might question that because, well, the law says I can't have any fun. And that's not love. It is love. It's the, the law tells us how we can get to heaven, and that's the greatest act of love is what Jesus did for us and what God has offered for us. And so we need to remember that. In Ephesians 5 ver verse 8 says, For you were once darkness, but now you are the light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. You remember, let your light shine. Matthew 5, 16. We are supposed to be the light to the world. Paul told the Philippians in Philippians 2, 13, you stand out as lights in this evil generation. And so, uh, verse Ephesians 5, 15, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. What this means, just pay attention to what's going on. Making sure you're, you're not walking into a trap. Make sure you're not walking into something that's, gonna cause you temptation to turn away from God. Pay attention to what you're doing. Keep yourself sober-minded in order to do that. <clears throat> All right, Ephesians 3 and verse 16, Paul writes, nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of the same mind. We need to do this together with all Christians. I mean, we, we need to behave the same way other Christians are behaving. And we should all be living the same way so that people will know who we are. And uh, uh, he, Paul was warning about some. He said, brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. So those people who are walking in the ways of God, they're a good pattern. But Paul also gave the warning, those who don't walk this way, you need to avoid them. All right, here's an admonition from Colossians 1.10 as Paul's speaking about his prayer for them, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So we're, he, he prayed that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will. And what happens when we get filled with the knowledge of God's will is that we begin to walk worthy of the Lord. Yes, the Lord is happy to call us his children. We're, he, he's glad that we have the name Christian attached to us when we are living the way that we're supposed to be living. All right, Colossians 4, 5 says, Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside redeeming the time. In other words, we, ha we have an example to set, and we've got to make sure we're setting the right example. We don't want to behave like the world because they won't notice anything about us. Walk in the way that God wants us to walk, and we might capture some attention and people be curious as to about, about our faith. You know, that's what Peter was talking about in, Second Pe in 1 Peter 3.15, uh, that they might ask you, we need to be ready. In 1 Thessalonians 2.12, he says that you would walk worthy of God who called you into his own kingdom and glory. 
So yeah, our lifestyle should be that way. All right, in 1 John 1, 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, uh, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So walking in the light means living the way he has commanded. Jesus has given us his light and told us the way and shown us the way. All we have to do is get on that way and follow it. In 1 John 2, 6, says, He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. And so let's say the scripture says, okay, Jesus was pigeon-toed. And you know what? We'd have to walk like pigeons. I mean, not, but it doesn't say that. Jesus walked pleasing God all along the way. So that's the way we need to walk. And 2 John 6, this is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. So we should behave in that. All right, and, and finally, 3 John verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. All right, so with this much use of scripture, how can anyone think that walking with God does not mean living the way he directs us to live? I mean, each person must choose the pathway they will walk, and that's true. And each must choose their lifestyle and pattern of living. That also is true. But recognize that choosing the right pattern, which God has told us to follow, then that'll produce for us eternal life. If we choose not to do that, then we are warned eternal damnation is in store for us. So each of us must be prepared to give an account about how they lived, how they walked, how they walked before God. Now, how about you? How is your walk with God? Consider these thoughts, and if this message is important to you, share it with others because other people need to hear it as well. All right, that's it for now. I'm glad I got through. I had some technical difficulties earlier, but anyway, Lord willing, be back again tomorrow with another lesson. Bye-bye for now.